Hi, this is Dr. Diane Gayhart, and this is my online lecture on systemic therapies. It's the first part, and it covers um, the MRI Institute and the Milan therapy. In part two, I cover strategic therapy, and you can also find lectures on more contemporary systemic approaches, such as um, EFT, emotionally focused therapy, as well as functional family therapy. And these, the, um, this particular um, lecture goes with uh, two of my textbooks. One is Mastering Competencies in Family Therapy and also Theory and Treatment Planning in Family Therapy. Both are published by Cengage and you can get either the chapter or, or the entire book uh, directly from the publisher at Cengage.com and you can get um, hard copies at your typical book retailers such as Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Systemic uh, family therapy includes several um, approaches, many of which were developed around the same time in the 1960s, um, primarily by three uh, groups of mental health practitioners. The first was the Mental Research Institute. Uh, in, it's also referred to as the Palo Alto Group. It's associated with Gregory Bateson. There's also the Milan Systemic Approach, which is based in Milan, Italy. And, and then there's also strategic therapy, which is closely associated with the work of Jay Haley and Chloe Madonis. And so these three approaches are distinct and especially um, were developed with distinct approaches, yet they use very, very similar, similar processes um, in other ways. And so I'm gonna present all three of these separately, and yet I will also highlight some of the similarities and differences as we go along. So I'm going to talk, begin by talking about the Mental Research Institute, the MRI is what I'll call it, um, and how you most frequently hear it referred to. And this um, is actually one of the first groups to develop uh, systemic therapy, arguably. And both the Milan and Strategic are kind of branched off from this particular group that began studying um, originally communication patterns in schizophrenic families and they developed this uh, therapeutic model, one of the first family models based on this research. So as one of the first systemic approaches, the MRI approach, one of the unique things that they do um, and that all later systemic approaches, really the heart of any systemic approach or kind of the defining characteristic is they look at individual symptoms and they conceptualize them within the broader family and social networks, looking at how that symptom functions within the broader system. And when therapists think about change um, in these contexts and how to help families change, they focus on introducing small yet meaningful changes to the family patterns. So a truly systemic therapist is not gonna try to go in and correct a family interaction pattern or educate people or try to just go and you're doing it wrong and do it this way because um, if you've noticed uh, humans at all they don't tend to take that advice and change their behaviors really easily and so what family system systemic therapists have done is they've looked at the natural patterns and try to find ways that allow families to more easily change those patterns because if you've ever tried to change a habit You'll notice it's not easy for humans to do that, especially when you look at groups of systems of people where you've got four, five, six, eight people who have a set of patterns and behaviors and intervening and changing all of that is very much more complex. And so they look at how that works and they try to introduce small, meaningful changes that allow the family to naturally reorganize. And so they're not correcting dysfunctional pat patterns. And if you hear someone talking like that, they're not thinking uh, truly systemically in the, what that word means. It's not about fixing things. It's, a, it's introducing small bits of meaningful change to that particular system. You study the system, you learn what's meaningful, and you make a shift there, and you allow the family to naturally reorganize. And so, and that's one of the hallmarks that we're going to see across all the different systemic approaches. So let's talk about one of their most significant contributions to the field, what I like to call the juice. Systemic reframing. Now this is a real art and you'll hear the term of reframing used across various different therapeutic models. 
but systemic family therapists do a very specific form of reframing. And what they do, instead of looking at an individual's symptoms and focusing on an individual's path pathology, um, maybe reframing it in terms of history, what, what family ther systemic family therapists do is they, they reframe the problem in terms of the family dynamic. And so they're looking for alternative yet equally plausible explanations for the same set of facts that may exist in this family system. And so they really look at the symptom and consider what kind of role it may play in maintaining the family homeostasis or the family norm or the family sense that everything is, is okay, the normal range of family behaviors. And so you're trying to look at finding an explanation for what's going on and a, a proposing a new way to look at things in terms of news that makes a difference. And so this reframe has to be something that will make um, a difference in this particular family system. So for example, a common actual reframe in systemic approaches is when you have a child who's maybe acting out. And after assessing the system and the dyna watching dynamics, um, the therapist may come to uh, develop the hypothesis that the reason this kid is acting out is because it unifies two parents who otherwise do have some discord and so this acting out child can distract the couple from their own issues and so they can focus on the child. Now I want to be real clear here, they're not, there's no one is getting blamed in systemic family therapy and I think that's also something that's very unique. There is, there is no blaming the child for doing this or blaming the parents for this. Instead they step back and say this is just how the family has negotiated its and kind of evolved over time to maintain its sense of integrity because if there is a system wants to hang together couples want to stay together there is this natural kind of pull together in terms of the systemic dynamics and systemic dynamics or how do we keep this family connected and so it's not like the child you know sat down talked to an aunt or uncle and tried to devise well, how can I keep my parents together um, but what happens is through interactional patterns, it becomes clear that when the kid's acting out, there's less stress in between the couple and that creates a sense of balance and things feel okay. And so it's none of it's, typically it's not conscious at all. And it's not, they don't conceptualize being subconscious or unconscious as you would in a psychodynamic way. Instead, it's an interactional pattern that's developed between people and there's no blame but the idea is what kind of, you know, um, and, and this is where we're going to see the difference, whether it's a reframe, whether um, we'll see some more behavioral directives at times, um, what kind of way of talking or what kind of things can we do to shift the meanings in this system? So the systemic frame, reframe is a real classic in terms of proposing that the child's, you know, um, tantrums are acting out or even sometimes uh, certain physical symptoms can be reframed as a way of the child um, or the you know the system unifying the parents to get them on the same page by focusing on the child and so this child could be then seen as you know sacrificing him or herself in order to keep the marriage together and this can be a very powerful intervention especially if the couple knows that they have tension and they know that the one time they're on the same page is when they're you know they're having difficulty with one of their children and I didn't believe this when I first started um, as a family therapist, uh, but often you will see there's the presenting, you know, identified patient, the child with a problem, we'll just call it the quote unquote problem child, bad child. And then often you'll have the angel, you know, problem free child. And often, uh, more often than I care to, uh, that was, I would believe would happen when I first started in this field, when problems um, subside with one child, the, you know, the formerly, you know, perfect child all of a sudden is starting to act out. And that's when you know you've got systemic dy dynamics going on and there is something to uh, the kid's uh, level of symptoms and something else uh, in the family system. Often pulling the, the keeping the couples together and unified. There were a lot of amazing therapists um, who trained at the MRI Institute. And here we have a list of some of the primary people who are associated with the MRI and throughout all my various lectures on systemic therapy, we will be referring back to MRI because many great family therapists who have their own approaches like Jay Haley, Virginia Satir, the Milan team, including um, 
Steve DeShazer, who developed solution-focused therapy, all of them studied at the MRI. Don Jackson um, was one of the uh, original um, thinkers and therapists and developers of MRI approach. Um, he did pass away relatively early, and Paul Václavic, John Weakland, and Richard Fish, um, Art Bodine, and William Fry also carried on some of that uh, early development of the work. Um, probably the most pro prolific um, author of the, this group is the Paul Václavic. Um, more recently, uh, Wendell Ray has been an archivist, and if you have any, um, he has archived all the original tapes from the MRI, and so if you are wanting to do uh, advanced doctoral research in this area, he's a great contact at the University um, of Louisiana at Monroe. And more recently, um, Barbara uh, Anger Diaz and Karen uh, Schlanger have been uh, working at the MRI Institute um, with, the, with the more contemporary programs. Giorgio Nardoni uh, works closely, um, in, but in Italy, um, with the MRI developing these ideas. But uh, there's a long history of many thinkers who have gone through the MRI, developing very, like a very unique uh, systemic approaches, um, having trained many of the people in family therapy. So next we're going to move on to the big picture, the overview of treatment at the MRI. And it is the briefest of brief therapies, and so it's um, an interesting one. It's, one of, it's really, I would say, the original brief uh, therapy method. So in terms of the process of MRI systemic therapy, um, they begin very much focusing on present interactional patterns, and they're going to track that interactional sequence, and we're going to talk a lot about that in all the systemic approaches. It's really a hallmark of systemic approaches. And they look at the problem, whatever the presenting symptom is, usually it's the individual uh, symptom, they look at it as part of a broader interactional behavior sequence. And they focus on first identifying what is the attempted solution. What is the family or couple trying to do, or even the individual trying to do, that has unsuccessfully solved the problem? And so they look at the logic of that type of solution. For example, a lot of parents will bring in their kids saying that the kid has tantrums or is acting out or is defiant and that I, we've tried everything and nothing has worked. And so the MRI therapists say, well, what, would, what have you tried? And, you know, they might say they tried timeouts, we tried putting him in his room, we tried taking away the TV, we tried this. And as you listen, those are variations of punishment, different ways. And often they start with, you know, they get more and more and harsher and harsher punishments and they you know, they're not working. So that's the class of attempted solutions. And typically what they're going to do is look for a 180. What would be the opposite of the at former attempted solutions, the failed attempted solutions? And so the opposite of punishment is going to be some kind of relationship building, typically. And so you're going to have to look at what makes sense for that particular system. And so then they look at interruptions that are used to interrupt these patterns, not necessarily correct them or fix them. And if you, um, one of the images that, that helps me with this is if you think of a school of fish, which is a type of uh, system, and you imagine, um, you know, they, they, uh, there's a school of fish maybe swimming in a circle, someone throws in a rock, and the whole, all the fish scatter. And if you watch them, they will regroup in a different pattern and uh, reorganize themselves. And that's the image. That's most helpful, I think, for understanding um, the interventions in the systemic approaches. They are not fixing them. No one's telling the fish where to swim. And that's kind of what it's like trying to micromanage, you know, family interactions. Trying to get all, let's say, four-foot people changing their behaviors is really hard. But if you throw a monkey wrench into their typical pattern, then you're going to, everyone has to change. Another good example is if you've got a dance floor, you got a couple dancing, they've got their, you know, pattern, this is the dance that they do. You do something like put a few pieces of furniture in the middle of that and they have to dance around it. Well, you know what? The dance is going to change. Both of them, some, they have to change because the situation is changing. And so um, this is where you can get some pretty outlandish, outlandish and sometimes not even logical ways to interrupt um, the problem sequence, a classic MRI intervention um, for couples who bicker 
is to, um, that Paul Potzlavik wrote about, you know, is that, okay, next time you guys start an argument, here's what I want you to do. I want one of you, I want both of you guys to be fully clothed. I want you to go into the bathroom. I want one of you to sit in the bathtub, you know, and the other one of you to sit on the toilet fully clothed. And I want you to have your arguments there. And just by changing the context, interrupting it, they're, they're just throwing a monkey wrench into the typical interaction sequence um, that something different is going to shift. And the truth is, most of, it, most of us know what we should be doing and we would choose better behaviors and interactions with others if we're not in our pattern in our rut and so what they do is they give the couple this um, opportunity um, to, and one or both of them is going to change what they typically do but just because you you interrupted their pattern and so that is the magic of the MI approach and you allow them to self-organize and the truth is it's, I, it's, I, I guess I've never seen anyone reorganize in a more negative way, if that, if that helps. Um, I guess it's theoretically possible, but most people, when you interrupt them, you kind of get them out of their negative interactional sequence, and when people get to consciously then choose their behaviors, they almost always choose a better behavior. Making connection with therapeutic relationship and MRI therapy. The therapeutic relationship and MRI therapy. Now, the therapeutic relationship, um, especially by traditional systemic family therapists, is a little hard to get used to because it's not about empathy necessarily. It's not about being harsh and cold, um, but it is a more, in some ways, detached because it is considered a brief therapy. It is not about getting clients to project and the role is a little more technical, but there is this very profound trust and respect of the individuals in the system that the systemic therapists really do believe that the family is, you know, with a little assistance and some you know, interruptions of their patterns, they're going to reorganize in a healthier way and they're going to be fine, healthy, normal, functioning, you know, couples and families. There really is this belief and trust and hope and very positive view. Um, they very much adapt their language and viewpoint to, to kind of get in sync with the family system. And they practice something called maneuverability. And basically the therapist will take whatever role is going to be most useful in promoting the family to change. And so they may be a more soft, empathetic style. It may be a more technical, kind of detached clinical style they will take whatever position they feel like is going to be most helpful to that particular couple or family or even individual to make change. And so they're very flexible in whatever position they take um, based on the particular family system and its needs. The viewing, case conceptualization in MRI strategic, in MRI therapy, keep throwing strategic in there um, because strategic is closely um, aligned. But the case conceptualization in MRI is probably the hardest part, and it's really something difficult to not learn in a clinical environment um, with a supervisor and a team, and you learn to begin to see systems. I'm going to do the best I can to introduce you to it, but learning to see systems is probably one of the most difficult shifts that uh, a therapist can make in learning to view things systemically. It is not a natural way to look or think at the world. We, we tend to look at, you know, A causes B and to focus on how B affects A and A affects B and that it's all interrelated and they're all interfected. That's much more complex. It's not intuitive um, for any human being I know. Even Gregory Bateson said it takes effort, um, more effort than we're used to in terms of conceptualizing. And so I think it certainly is one of the most difficult approaches in terms of conceptualization. That said, I'm trying to break it down so that it's easier um, to learn in this particular lecture. So and when MRI therapists conceptualize what's going on, they're focusing on the interaction patterns, the patterns between people. They're not trying to analyze the psychopathology or within the individual. And so when they conceptualize what's going on, they begin and looking at, you know, what does normal look like? Um, what, is, what is the homeostasis? What is a normal range of acceptable behaviors within this, you know, relational system? 
And then they begin to track the, how the tension rises, and this is what's called early positive feedback in systems thinking. And so positive feedback is a sense that is feedback that, uh-oh, something, w the behaviors are going outside the normal acceptable range. And then there's the symptom, typically the positive feedback, oh no, something is out of, you know, acceptable range. And then, you know, the, the system is then going to take corrective action in order to bring the system back to homeostasis. So if homeostasis is, we're all getting along, we're joking, we're having um, a fine time, um, then the symptom rises, maybe um, in a family, this might be, um, you know, someone's, people are getting cranky, then there may be the symptom, it might be a large conflict, it may be a child's tantrum, um, it may be a cutting episode um, with a teen, it, you know, any type of symptom behavior. And then you look at the self-correction. So after this explosion, what, who, who's doing what to try to either make up or pretend like nothing happened? But somehow, someone in the system, because it becomes so uncomfortable, people are going to start doing different things to bring it back to homeostasis. And so you want to look at what those patterns are. Is it the same person who apologizes every time? Is it the same peacemaker who makes peace no matter who's fighting in the family? Do people just all go to bed and pretend like nothing happened in the morning? It's very important. This is probably one of the most important and, and um, diagnostic things is to, to understand how do they self-correct to get back to normal, quote unquote, homeostasis. And then, you, so you keep tracking um, this interactional pattern. And all of the systemic approaches will, are gonna do this in some way. And so, uh, for the MRI, it's a very um, behavioral approach, looking at what people are doing, and they're also focusing less on the content, not what the temper tantrum is about, but looking and asking and learning about more about what's called metacommunication, or um, what what is the communication about the communication. So, for example, when a child throws a temper tantrum, what is that about? It is, you know, and so you want to ask, you know, often it is, the child is expecting that his um, desires should be ruling the family or whatever you know it might be, but it's I'm in control, you're not in control of me, parent. And so you would look for what is the, and the parent's response is typically, you know, no, I'm the one in control. So looking at those type of interactional sequences and what they mean and tracking those uh, in terms of the, the messages about the relationships and interrelationships in the family system. So MRI systemic family therapists and the whole approach is based on the assumption that one cannot not communicate. We're always communicating. So when a family comes in or a couple comes in, or an individual comes in and says, you know, I just can't communicate with my spouse or my kids or my partner or whatever it is, um, a systemic therapist knows that that's not accurate they are communicating, but they just don't like what's being communicated and how it's being communicated. Stone cold uh, silence communicates a lot, actually. <laughs> um, and so, so the MRI therapist, when someone says that, they start becoming curious about what is being communicated and how. Why are they having a sense that they're not communicating? And they also look specifically at the symptoms as a form of communication. You know, a child throwing a temper tantrum is a form of communication. A child cutting is a form of communication. Oh, uh, you know, a partner nagging is a form of communication. A partner withdrawing is another form of communication. They're trying to say something to their partner or child or significant others. And so the, um, the systemic therapist is, is going to look at uh, what's what what is being commun what is actually being communicated and why and what are the patterns there and what are the uh, usually from an MRI perspective all those communications is there e each person is trying to define the relationship on their own terms who's in control um, who's got the most power or influence um, and those sorts of things you know who, who where who's loving who and what's that all about. So they're looking at what each communication, which can be verbal or nonverbal, behavioral, uh, what each form of communication it, and how it is trying to define the various relationships. So as mentioned earlier, one of the hallmarks of the MRI approach 
is assessing for these more of the same solutions or the attempted solution. And these are the solutions the family has tried and did not work, and instead they're perpetuating the actual problem. And so there's some common um, forms of these more of the same uh, solutions you can look for. One is what they call terrible simplifications, and that is when action is necessary but none is being taken. And so this is common with addictions, uh, marital conflict, or family problems where somebody does need to address um, an alcohol or drug abuse type of problem and no one is doing it or there's definitely trouble in the marriage and everyone's pretending like it's not there. Uh, there's also something called the utopian syndrome and this is when action is being taken when none is actually necessary. So this can be seen with a parent having very perfectionistic um, expectations of a child and you can see the symptoms that you typically see in this might be depression or anxiety, um, procrastination, and those sorts of things. And so here people are trying to, um, they're taking action to change something that's either unchangeable or is not developmentally appropriate to be changed. And then finally we have paradox. And that is when um, action is taken but at the wrong level. And so in this case, um, you're looking at a first order solution to a second order problem or a second order a solution to what's a first order problem. What does first and second order mean? Um, it's described in another chapter. I'll summarize it here. Well, first order solutions are you, um, you're changing, um, the change is not, the second order change is when you're changing the actual structure of the system. Where first order, you're just changing the organization of the specific parts, but the basic dynamics and homeostasis are the same. And so an example um, of this is when a person is demanding an attitude or personality change in their partner or child when the correct solution is actually a behavioral change. So they're wanting their partner or child to be or do something and be something that they're not, which is set, would be a second order change. When what they, you know, what's a reasonable change or a solution here is a first order change, you know. Rather than, um, you know, getting your child to love having a clean room, you're just going to get them to clean their room. You know, asking for that um, attitude shift is, is, is unrealistic. Or another common one is wanting your partner to be romantic and, you know, bring flowers and dates and romance and magic and mystery like we did when we first met to the relationship where, you know, into a 20-year-old or 10-year-old relationship would, would, you know, be a second order shift when a first order shift of, you know, organizing a date, um, doing what the person is asking, it's more of a behavioral shift, is more realistic and what's possible at this developmental stage of the, the marriage. So these are some ways um, what they mean by the paradoxical levels. So the original communications uh, theory developed at the MRI, which is the foundation of most systemic approaches, talks about the concept of metacommunication. And this is communication about communication. Um, and this is often um, in communication theory referred to as the command aspect of communication. The, so you have the report aspect, which is the content, and then there is the command aspect, which is defines the relationship. And that's really where all of our conflict tends to arrive from. The command aspect is typically nonverbal um, and is typically a comment on the relationship. So uh, both parents and children and partners complain about everybody's tone and that's what they're complaining about. And typically the tone is saying, hey, I'm in charge of you and that's often where the conflict erupts because no one, uh, very few of us, um, you know, agree like to hear that the other person's in control and then there's also adjusting that based on a you know parental hierarchy and such. So some of the forms of metacommunication are voice, tone, gesture, eyes, um, and so what you're looking for is whether or not that these uh, metacommunication reinforces the ver verbal message which would be con congruent, um, whether it's uh, satirizing the verbal message so where it's openly contradicting um, or creating a double bind. So on one hand, there's a verbal, um, the verbal element, the report element is, you know, saying one thing and the command or the command element, the nonverbal 
um, is, is con con contradicting that, and that cannot be directly commented on or successfully commented on. And so a classic example of that is when um, a mother, uh, when a son goes to hug his mother and, you know, her, her response to that is, you know, how come you never show me affection? And so, and in that system, there's no way to successfully comment on that. And so that's where the, um, the, the contradiction is, or she freezes up when he goes to hug her you know, there's this freeze up and then it's like, you never show me affection, but it's like, you won't let me hug you. And yet you're saying, I don't show you affection. And, and so the kid feels totally caught in being able to comment on that. Um, another one I've seen is, you know, the parent says, no, I do trust you. I really do trust you, but, and then they go on to the reasons why they don't trust them. And so the kid's trying to say, but you don't trust me. And the kid, no, no, the parent's like, no, 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 I do. And then they have their long list of exceptions and reasons, da, 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 da. and there's no way for the kid to successfully communicate with the parent about this contradiction. So if you find yourself struggling with uh, assessing in a systemic approach, I do think one of the most useful and easiest elements of system, systemic dynamics to um, conceptualize are what they call complementary or symmetrical patterns. So complementary are when two people in the system have um, opposite kind of roles and they get exaggerated. It's not problematic to have complementary roles um, if no one's having symptoms in the system um, and they don't get exaggerated. Uh, where symmetrical patterns are where um, people are actually taking similar roles. So the, um, the more uh, frequent ones that need to be uh, assessed or thought about through or some examples of these complementary patterns include the pursuer distancer. So one person is pursuing for intimacy and the other is distancing. And there's all, there's typically, you know, there's some, like in, in couple relationships, there's typically a pursuer and a distancer. And this should ebb and flow across time and ideally flip back and forth. And that can be a relatively, you know, a healthy system, a healthy couple system. And over time it can go back and forth. But the more exaggerated it becomes, and the, um, the more lopsided that becomes, the more problems you're going to typically experience in the relationship. There's also the criticize and defend um, pattern. One is, and similarly is controlling and resisting control patterns. Uh, sometimes with couples in particular, sometimes with uh, siblings, you can see the logical one and the emotional one. She's the one who has all the emotions and he's all logic. And ideally those should actually be within the same person and that should, you know, but sometimes you'll see with couples, especially the ones who've been together for a long time, that they become so polarized on this that she only does emotions, he only does logic, and they drive each other crazy. And they begin, it begins to feel like he's, he's logical and she's emotional, and he doesn't have emotions and she can't be logical. And that is one of the pieces of real insight and wisdom that comes from beginning to see things systemically. It's like, no, that reality has only been created because of the dynamics of this system. And that's where the systemic therapists are able to see that and not um, believe that, you know, this is attributed to the um, one person or another. These are not personality characteristics. These are dynamics of the system. Same with the helpless one and the rescuer. You can certainly, again, especially with, between couples, you can see the one who's one's rescuing and one's, you know, sick or helpless in some way. Again, you will frequently see the, what I call the overfunction or underfunctioner pattern. And that's where one's doing all the work, and the more that one functions, the more the other one underfunction. They begin to believe that you know one's incompetent, one's you know super neurotically competent, and they begin to believe that those are personality characteristics. Each person believes it, and so they don't even question it. Similarly, you can get the good parent, bad parent um, dynamic, or the social recluse, or the oversexed, undersexed. Um, and so you get these very exaggerated patterns that people really do begin to believe that these are in the individuals rather than a dynamic, a part of the systemic dynamics that have evolved over time. Another distinction that MRI therapists make when conceptualizing the family system is first and second order change. Now first order change, as I mentioned earlier, involves changing the roles within the system. And this feels really different when you're in the system. And so this is like, for example, when the 
The pursuer becomes a withdrawer and the withdrawer becomes the pursuer. So if you've been in a relationship with, you know, a partner where you've been pursuing for, you know, a long time and not feeling responded to, when the with person who's been withdrawing becomes the pursuer and you're the one withdrawing, it feels like there's going to be a major shift in the relationship. And that's what it's going to feel like to those in the system. Um, but that is still considered first order change because in that shift, they've kind of maintained the same level of intimacy. There's a certain, only so much intimacy that this couple can could handle. Whereas second order change would be a fundamental restructuring of the system. Um, in this case, it would uh, typically look like the couple is actually has more intimacy. There's a fundamental change. They're not, the roles have not flipped. Instead, the roles are, both roles are totally different. Now, when we describe this conceptually, it does sound like, well, you can have first and second order change. And I said, often in life, in therapy, it feels like there's more like 1.5 order change. There's been some sh things that do seem really different and some parts are similar. Um, and uh, from an MIR perspective, not every problem needs a second order change. Sometimes first order change is acceptable. Um, I can, what comes to my mind here is when the parent-child hierarchy is reversed when the child's been calling the shots rather than the parents. Just shifting um, that around is, can sometimes be in a, a, if, you know, the change that needed to happen. You don't need to reorganize the whole system. Um, but typically, uh, therapy focuses on second order change, but it's not always necessary. Also, typically, not always, uh, you will have first order change before you have second order change. So Often there will be some shifting in the roles of the system might flip before you have the true kind of reorganization um, of the basic homeostatic, you know, patterns within a system. So another key element to um, case conceptualization in MRI systemic therapy is they were, if not the first, one of the first therapeutic approaches that use an observational team because they really did start off as a research team and they were observing families and communication and noticing the pattern discussing them like researchers and that research approach is what evolved into um, the systemic family therapy approach and typically uh, a team was behind the mirror and there was a person uh, in the session the therapist uh, talking to the family Typically, uh, halfway through, the therapist would come out, consult with the team. The reason for that is that typically the team, because they're not in the room, they're not in the conversation, they're not becoming part of the system, that they can see the systemic dynamics before the person in the room. And if you get uh, the opportunity to train or work in a systemic, uh, where you can do observational teams with clients, you will notice that you're always much smarter and wiser behind the mirror than you are in front of it. Um, and so, and this is a very useful way to train when working with couples and families because it's, it's much harder when you're in it and you're part of the dynamic, you become part of the dynamics. Um, it's much harder to see those patterns when you're in the conversation, in the room with them, rather than sitting back and watching the show unfold. And so that is why they use those observation teams and they're frequently used in the training of couple and family therapists. And like I say, if you get an opportunity to do this, it's one of the the fastest and best way to train to learn how to work with couples and families and think systemically. Targeting change, setting goals in MRI therapy. So when it comes to goal setting, MRI systemic therapists are extremely minimalist. They just want symptom-free interaction patterns. And so they, you know, how can we get this, you know, individual couple family to to not have symptoms. That's all they're here to fix. They don't have underlying theories of health and normalcy. You've got to have a family that looks like this before I'm going to terminate treatment. That's not how they think. They're like, how do we get the presenting symptoms to go away and for them to have a sustained interaction patterns without the symptoms? They do not have theories of health. And so they look at the problem as the attempted solution. So they look, they define what the problem is um, in very behavioral terms. They identify the attempted solutions and then they describe the behavioral change and they develop a plan um, to target the attempted solution. And so this is how they work. And so in terms of uh, the target of change is the attempted solution. That's what they're going to focus on changing, getting a different class and type of solution, typically what they call a 180 degree shift, the opposite type of um, solution. 
And then the tactic of change is usually using the client's own language, and we'll be talking about that in interventions. Interventions in MRI systemic therapy. So as we mentioned in the, the juice section, a significant contribution to the field, this concept of um, systemic reframing is one of the key um, interventions used in MRI approach where they take the symptom and they reframe it in the broader context of the family dynamic. So for example, the, you know, that a child tantrum or symptom or behaviors are, they are sacrificing themselves in order to unify the couple and keep the marriage together. So that's a type of systemic reframe. Then they also look at what they, uh, I try to identify less of the same behavior prescriptions. And so then this is where they identify, you know, what is the attempted solution. So for example, you know, more and more punishments. And then they try to identify an alternative behavior that will alter that pattern. And then they give the client these prescription behaviors. So when they leave sessions, they um, have to do this, whatever the prescribed behavior is. And so um, in terms of, for example, with um, the punishments, um, that could, uh, a 180 shift from that could be building the, thera the, couple, the family relationship, uh, the parent-child bond and relationship. You could also have a 180 shift could be rewarding that behavior with something. Um, and so depending on the family and the system and the meanings that are being made, they would develop an intervention, uh, pres behavioral prescription, send them home with it. And when they come back the next week, they see what happens. They say, how did that work out for you? And based on however that happened, they would shift or adjust um, their reframe and or the behavior prescription for the next week. And they just basically keep doing that until the symptoms go away. I mean, that's, that's all that's to it, and that's what makes it so brief uh, in how they intervene. So the therapeutic double bind um, sometimes is considered a paradoxical intervention. And often uh, people become concerned when they hear about these paradoxical interventions. The more you work with couples and families, the more they begin to make sense because uh, there, when there is a double bind, it seems like there's no way, you know, no matter what you suggest, someone, you know, is like, no, that won't work. No, that won't work. There's all these excuses, rationalizations going on. So I will don't try using double, therapeutic double binds or paradox until it makes perfect sense, and you'll know the moment when it's time for a therapeutic double bind. So this is when you do more of this. Um, so what you're doing here, instead of doing um, less of the same, you're going to do more of the same behavior prescription. And this is um, there are certain families and certain systems, certain individuals where um, direct symptom uh, direct um, interventions to interrupt this the um, problem behavior just seem they just don't work no one follows through on it no one can do it no one will do it so this is when you move on to the therapeutic double bind and this is when you're going to prescribe more of the same but in a slightly different way and again what you're doing here is you're interrupting that symptom you're putting a couple pieces of furniture into the living room so they have to move differently around in their little dance and so they cannot not do something different. Something cannot not change. It's something that's going to change. So, um, and what this is, the purpose of this is, and these are carefully constructed, this is where it's really helpful to have that team behind the mirror helping you design one of the, these things. It takes a pretty good therapist to do this off and, on the cuff, um, or off the cuff, um, is to undo the double bind message in the family. And so with the therapeutic double bind, no matter what you do, it's going to be different. Even if you do the same old behavior, it now has a new meaning. So a common example of a double bind is a wife who wants more romance from her partner, her husband, and um, but if she does what he if he does what she asks, then she compl complains that he only did it because you only you know because I asked you. You're only buying me flowers because I asked, so it doesn't count. You know you're only taking me on a romantic date because I asked, and so it doesn't count. And so no matter what he does. It's never good enough because she's demanding uh, she's demanding a spontaneous behavior, which is a double bind. You cannot, you know, demand that somebody uh, feel a certain way. That is actually it makes no logical sense, and yet human beings do it all the time to each other, especially in couples and families. So the therapeutic double bind would be uh, the directive would he he needs to do um, initiate a new behavior, but he but he cannot do what she's asking. So that's the double bind. So he needs to do something different, but anything but though, 
The one thing he cannot do is what she's asking for. So this puts him in a double bind where if he does come up with a new romantic behavior um, that she didn't ask for, he can win. And then if he does do what she asks for, then it's very possible that it can be interpreted, well, you were told not to do it, but you did it anyway. And so then it's of his own volition. And so it's less of a command because you've, undone, you, you've kind of undermined her specific command. So in, by changing the context in which her command is made. So you put him, you create this therapeutic double bind where no matter what he does, it is something different um, and that can have a new meaning in the system. So therapeutic double binds are a little tricky to figure out when and how to use them, but you be clear when nothing else seems to be working, this will begin to make sense. And, um, and like I said, in the beginning, it's, it's something that's harder to do, you know, in the moment, but with more practice, it becomes easier to understand how these work. And again, it's another behavioral experiment. They go home, you see how it works, and you see what me new meanings, new interactional patterns develop out of this. And then you adjust the following week as necessary. Another intervention that is sometimes used, it has, a, again, a, a paradoxical flavor here. It's what they call the dangers of improvement. So as couples and families um, or individuals start to get better, um, beginning to have clients identify the potential problems that might arise um, as the problem is getting resolved or if the problem gets resolved. Um, for example, um, when you're working with someone who has typically um, had a lot of drama and excitement um, in terms of their relational patterns and if they're coming in saying we don't want to have conflict and drama, you know, danger of improvement. So, you know, if you guys really have no conflict in this relationship, might you become bored with that? Is that a possibility? What other things might happen if there's really no conflict? You know, may the sex end. You know, you're going to have the hot, you know, passionate makeup sex. How might, you know, ending conflict in this relationship affect you guys, you know, and potentially in, in other ways? And this can have a very um, helpful way in helping the couple reframe what's going on, think about things differently, and re-experience things differently. Another a paradoxical technique that's sometimes used in the MRI approach is called restraining or going slow. And so this is a directive that might be, um, as the changes start to happen, to restrain them. You may want to, you know, take slow down with all this. You're, you guys are making some big changes really fast, you know, and so what might be um, some of the dangers of this? This can work in several uh, different ways. It can help them, um, you know, deal with setbacks in a more positive way. Again, it can help them develop more realistic expectations. Again, the family's going to make the meaning that they need to be making um, from that intervention. They're going to use that to reorganize and set their homeostasis um, or redefine homeostasis uh, in, in more helpful ways. And again, it helps them reframe even the, um, the progress that they're having. And so now we're going to move on to talking about Milan Systemic Therapy. And Milan Systemic Therapy was developed by a team of four therapists in Milan who came and studied at the MRI Institute. And when they came back, they really wanted to focus on implementing the cybernetic theories of Gregory Bateson as purely as possible. And so that was their mission um, when they developed their systemic approach. So in a nutshell, the least you need to know about Milan. Um, what you're going to notice about the Milan approach is that it's a much more language-based approach um, using a lot of reframing and circular questions. Um, they also refer to these interactional patterns as family games, and we'll talk some more about that. And they use a lot of what's called what they call positive connotation to reframe the symptoms. So they're very focused on looking for what is the positive um, spin on this. And they really focus on shifting family interactions by shifting what they call the family's epistemology in view of the problem. So epistemology is how do we know what we know. And so what they're trying to shift is the family's way of making meaning and how they punctuate reality, what they focus on, how they label things. So there's a lot of attention to the use of language. Um, the Milan um, therapist actually became very closely aligned with some of the more postmodern social constructions approaches, which again are very um, focused on how we construct meaning and how we construct our realities through language. Juice, um, the juice, significant contributions of the MRI approach. Circular questions. I think circular questions are some of the um, 
most wonderful systemic interventions. No matter what approach you work with, um, when working with uh, couples and families, or especially actually when working with indivi individuals and you're trying to understand their systemic dynamics that surround their symptoms, um, uh, circular questions are just beautiful, simple, uh, elegant. They're, they're elegant. They are s because what you do is through this series of very non-confrontational, gentle, curious, open questions, you, ha you work with clients to explore the interactional um, dynamics and also the meanings around those and how people are interpreting and making sense, kind of identifying the underlying epistemologies, as they would say. And so, um, and again, whenever I work with an individual, I need to assess that interactional uh, sequence of behaviors, and so these types of circular questions are just invaluable. I use them um, very frequently. And what's beautiful, though, not only are they assessment, but they are also intervention. So as you have the family or couple or individual um, start answering these questions about the interactional sequences and um, behaviors and meanings, you don't need to confront anybody. Um, as you ask questions like, you know, who do you think is the most depressed in the family? You know, each person talks and explores that. Um, it becomes very clear that there are a lot of different realities and every there's like multiple levels of reframing and, and recontextualizing things and you're just simply asking curious questions and they're doing all the work for you. And so it is um, a very elegant, non-threatening, simple, if some of the other interventions you hear about, uh, such as directives and stuff, or when we get to uh, Jay Haley and um, the part two of this lecture, with some of his kind of outlandish directives you sometimes hear about, you know, for systemic therapy, this circular question is the very gentle and elegant um, way to intervene and address these, um, as both assess and intervene at the same time with these interactional problem interactional uh, dynamics. There are numerous different types of circular questions, um, and so we're going to go through some of them here. One of the most basic is the behavioral sequence questions, and so this is um, tracing the entire interactional sequence um, around whatever the presenting problem might be. Um, so, so, you know, when little Johnny gets mad, what does dad do? And, you know, and if the primary presenting issue is dad and little Johnny are fighting, one of the things that any good systemic therapist is going to do is ask, though, but what is mom and sister doing in the background? Is there anyone else who's got an opinion about what's going on? And so when little Johnny and daddy are arguing, what's mom doing? What's sister doing? What's going on? How do things get back to normal? And you just ask all these different behavioral um, interaction sequence uh, questions. Then there's behavioral uh, difference. So... For example, if a kid says, you know, my mom's a nag, and so you would ask, so what does, it, what does she do that makes you want to call her a nag? And when you get the description, you know, and so how does your dad ask you to do things? And how, how do you ask your mom to do things? You know, how would your sister ask your mom? How does your sister ask your dad? And so you just start asking all these questions. You're not sure what's going to unfold. You're still kind of assessing. But you're comparing, you know. So, um... How does, you know, how do you make a behavioral request out of, how does your dad make a behavioral request of you? How do you make a request of your dad and your mom and your sister? And how is everyone doing it? And just by having these different descriptions, and even, everyone can even have a different opinion, and that's totally fine. And as they start describing these things, the reframes and the patterns, and the family begins to see this, or even if you're working with an individual, as you ask them to start comparing these different all, you know, compare every left, right, center, and every which direction, even an individual begins to see the patterns, and you're not having to confront them. And that's what I love about these. Um, there's also comparison and ranking questions, and these um, can be incredibly um, enlightening. So comparing, you know, on anything. So, you know, we're talking about depression. You know, who, who gets the press the most often, or who's the most depressed, or who's Who's the best listener? Who's the worst, you know, least compliant with the parent? And, and you know, which situation? Then you might want to change up some situations. So, you know, um, regarding homework, you know, who's the most cooperative? And regarding house, you know, helping around the house, who's the most cooperative? And at the holidays or whatever. And then, um, so those are really fun. And you can also have hypothetical circular questions. So, you know, if your um, mom ended up in the hospital, who do you think would be the most helpful? Who do you think would be... Um, 
most worried about her? Who do you think would be the least worried? Who do you think would be helping them most out around the house? Who do you think would be doing the cooking? Who would you think the you know? So you would start asking these hypothetical questions where you begin to understand the logic of the system. Similar with before and after questions. So, you know, before, um, you know, let's say dad goes on an alcoholic binge, what's going on? What happens after? How is mom different? How is sister different? How are grandparents? How is dad before? How is dad after? You ask all these, you know, before and after questions to, uh, again, understand the logic and the meanings of the system. And of course, you can do rankings in there and comparison. So you can just have tons of fun with this. But what you're doing is you're trying to um, track that interactional sequence and also the different meanings within the system and how they understand things and the logics of the system. And just depending on the client's presenting problem, you would ask, you know, which, whatever type of question. These are, as you can see, endless and a ton of fun and extremely useful because while you're assessing um, there simultaneously uh, there's an intervention usually going on and the reframing they're doing it for you so um, the Milan team the original Milan team began with um, Mara Palazzoli, Gianfranco Cicchin, Luigi Boscolo and uh, Giuliana Prata and um, Eventually, the team kind of set, uh, divided into the two females and the two males, with uh, Palazzoli and Prata focusing a lot on the invariant prescription, we'll talk about that shortly, and working with anorexic uh, and schizophrenic families, doing more research, where Chikin and Boscolo developed more the training element, um, focusing on developing a model and uh, doing uh, training folks in the model. I once had a conversation with uh, Gianfranco Chikin um, about, you know, his work and one of the comments he said, you know, we really divided on economic lines because the men had to support families and the women didn't. And so we had to create an institute and do training um, to support our families and, and the ladies got to stay behind, got to just focus on research because they didn't have to make money. And I always thought that was a very interesting comment. The Big Picture, an Overview of Treatment in Milan Systemic Therapy. Milan Systemic Therapy is uh, frequently referred to as long-term grief therapy. And basically, they were working with people from all over Italy. And so typically, um, the families would only come in once a month. And they were fine with this because their thought was that they're doing very complex interventions into systems, and it can take a month for um, the changes uh, and for the interventions to have some effect. So once a month they would meet with the family and the basic structure of the session was there'd be a pre-session where they would hypothesize about what would, might be going on. They were very, uh, Gianfranco and um, Luigi were very famous for saying, we never want to marry our hypotheses, meaning we don't want to believe ourselves too much. And they, that was really, but they would develop these hypotheses as, and, but they would let go of them as soon as they sh proved not to be correct. But they used this to help generate their interventions. They'd have a session. Then there'd be the intercession where they'd go meet with the team behind the mirror. Uh, they call the person in the session the conductor. And then they'd uh, go in and deliver the intervention, and then the team would um, have a discussion about how it went. And so typically it uh, would take a year, and they would meet uh, once a month. And so typically, too, they were dealing with uh, families, with a child as a presenting um, a problem and so they would typically spend the first couple of sessions um, kind of reframing the symptom and and then typically by session three they would have the sessions only with the um, with the parents and they would typically shift this to focusing on the parents either as a couple um, or for the parenting issues and so that's typically the pattern that they had making connections the therapeutic relationship in Milan therapy Two concepts that um, the Milan team really introduced to the field were the concepts of neutrality and multipartiality. And so they originally introduced the concept of neutrality, meaning that you're not taking sides with any of the family members or on the problem, certainly not um, blaming. They were very neutral. And uh, they later redefined this, as some people saw this as being non-emotional, non-attached, which probably in the context of Italy is not what was going on. Um, 
so they refo reframe this as multi-partiality. So they're willing to take and honor all perspectives. Um, and so they were famous for saying, you know, they're hoping at the end of therapy, everyone thought that each member of the family thought that the therapist was on their side because they were able to, you know, show empathy for each person's perspective and understanding of and respect for each person's perspective, which is a very important and difficult skill um, in couple and family therapy. And so um, some other concepts they used to conceptualize their relationship. One was what they called therapeutic curiosity. And this is the sincere interest in hearing each person's perspective within the system. And so there was this kind of enthusiastic embrace and curiosity about how each person saw it. The other piece that they used is this concept of an aesthetic curiosity. And so they didn't believe that there was a singular truth um, about anyone, uh, about what was going on. Instead, they were curious about the emerging patterns. And so they were curious about the patterns, the aesthetics of the system and how they morphed and changed and, and how the family, everyone made meanings and interacted. And there was this curiosity for how the system emerged. Another concept that use, they used to describe their later work is the concept of irreverence. And you can see this often in earlier tapes of Milan and other systemic therapists. And a lot of people find this somewhat offensive in some ways, but I think there is a real art to, under, to what they are doing and um, to understanding what's going on here. Because their irreverence really captures the therapist's relationship to the problem, not to the client. So no matter how horrific or terrible the family might think a particular situation is, the therapist, and this is true of, of all of the MRI, Strategic, and Milan, one of the things that's so hard to be able to do this therapeutic approach right is they never buy into oh, the, the fear that many people have around whatever the presenting problem is. There's a sort of like... Um, irreverence to it in a way that allows them to be creative and so they don't see that you know that there's a personality flaw or an illness or unresolved childhood issues um, but they really do believe that systems can be self-correcting and that there's this openness this creativity this willingness to play and be flexible um, that really is noteworthy um, and so if you feel like, oh my God, this is terrible, this is horrible, this will, you know, no one can ever overcome this problem. If a therapist comes to the situation like that, there's not a lot of hope, let me tell you. And so this irreverence is this willingness to be creative, think outside the box, think outside the system is really what that means here. Um, and so, there, so they, the therapist never feels hopeless. And that's about the problem. So you're not being rude to your clients. Um, but you aren't feeling prisoner to the problem, which is a very common um, ex experience. Another thing that the um, Milan therapists emphasize, and this comes from their focus on uh, trying to embody Bateson's work, is this unavoidable influence of the therapist. And so they really saw the role of the therapist um, as inherently affecting the system. And so they really tried to monitor and notice how they are affecting the family and the expression of the symptoms. And so they never saw themselves as the expert. Whatever hypothesis or interventions, they saw themselves as, um, if whatever they were doing was not helpful, um, then they were wrong, not the family. And so they were very quick to, even when developing their own theories, to abandon any concept that didn't seem to be helpful or useful. So again, it's like they're not the experts, um, but they're part of this system, and what they're doing and seeing is you know, everything from a systemic perspective, everything you notice is a reflection of your, your epistemology, not theirs. You're drawing the distinctions. That's coming from your constructions of the world not necessarily theirs and so it's understanding that all these descriptions this hypothesis you've created these theories you're coming up with they're all about you and if they're not working or change making the change that needs to happen you need to change you um, before they before you can be helpful to them the viewing case conceptualization 
So in terms of interactional sequences, the uh, Milan team called these family games. And again, this term doesn't really translate well to English because uh, games can have a, a connotation of manipulation. And uh, the intent more is these are just the interactional patterns that create the homeostasis. And it's maybe think of more playful games um, than manipulative games, but it really just maybe this better translated interactional sequences. And so these are, again, um, these are relational rules for how the family interacts, but they're not consciously created. They emerge naturally from family interaction patterns. And so when you watch couples come together, they, even from their very first interactions, they begin to create their own micro, micro little culture. And it is both influenced by their families of origin, but the two of them create their own thing. And so... Um, a lot of what those circular questions are designed to use to help identify this interactional sequence or game. So another thing that Milan therapists really focus on is how language is used, particularly descriptions of self and others, and how this shapes the reality and particularly their experience of the presenting problem. So they're very famous for turning all these adjectives like I am depressed, um, he's an angry person, um, and, and, and they change those into verbs, you know, the person is doing depression, the person is doing anger, to highlight that there is choice, that there are behaviors, and to make it less of a label and more of an action, which is actually easier to shift. So a much more subtle uh, concept here is what they call the uh, family epistemology and epistemological errors. So this again comes out of the work of Gregory Bates, and they talk about family epistemology. And so epistemology is how we know what we know, and when it's applied practically in family systems work, it's looking at how the family, quote unquote, punctuates events. So do you focus on, you know, for example, a wife may come in and say, he withdraws, he doesn't show any attention to me, and he, the husband may say, oh, but she nags. And so that's how each one is, I, uh, but I only nag because you withdraw, and I only withdraw because you nag, and the chicken and the egg. And so this is where the family therapist reframes and put those two, um, those two dynamics, which each person is only des describing half of it, into the larger systemic kind of reframing of that. So looking at that, um, those, those epistemologies and how they frame things um, is, is how one of the things that family therapists, uh, Milan systemic therapists, are how they're assessing what's going on in the family and how they're making meaning, how are they interpreting a, per, a child's depression or tantrums, you know, um, are they de defining it, you know, as, oh my God, maybe my kid's had his ADHD, or, you know, the kid's having tantrums because his mother's not strict enough with him, or the, some other might say, he's having tantrums because you're too strict with him. What kind of meanings are they making from all of this, and how are they interpreting it? And so this is what they talk, what they mean by um, the family's epistemology, and they're looking for epistemological errors which is where they're getting stuck. And a common one is only focusing on how the other person's doing something wrong rather on than your half of the um, interactional uh, sequence. Targeting change, goal setting in Milan systemic therapy. So when uh, developing goals, conceptualizing where this uh, treatment's gonna go, Milan systemic therapists really focus on making new meaning, so achieving some kind of new meaning so that the uh, symptoms are no longer necessary. So they're looking at generating new meanings, new ways of punctuating things that are going on that changes the quote-unquote games or interactional sequences within the family. So again, just like the MRI, they're not trying to literally fix or educate the family on how to behave and communicate better. And again, instead they're perturbing the system with new inter interpretations, new ways of framing things, and allowing the system to self-correct itself. Again, from a systemic, having that systemic assumption that the system will reorganize in a better way if you interrupt it. That those kind of default, you know, um, patterns, when you interrupt them, people choose um, better interactions. And that's just what they trust that dynamic and that's what they're trying to do. Again, similar to the MRI approach, there are no predefined goals based on health or you know ideas of family, normal family functioning. The goals are just simply to reduce the symptoms by creating new interactional patterns. So the family's gonna integrate new information, change its rules, and the idea is for the family to be able to maintain stability 
and cohesion as a family system without having the problem symptoms. Again, very similar to the MRI approach. And again, it, there is, it, there's no norm there. So again, this is going to allow it to be a little more uh, flexible across cultures. The doing interventions in the long systemic therapy. So in terms of intervening, a lot of the intervention uh, process is built around the hypothesizing process. And there are really two phases. One is hypothesizing for conceptualization. And so this is typically done behind the mirror um, with the team talking to one another to come up with a hypothesis, hypothesis in that pre-session um, we talked about earlier. Then there's hypothesizing as an intervention. And so from as they um, have this hypothesis, they interview the family using circular questions, and then they can deliver a hypothesis as an intervention. And so, and typically, we're going to talk about this in the next slide, I believe, um, they're going to hypothesize uh, with a positive connotation. But there are three types of hypotheses, typically. One is about alliances, who's on whose team. Another hypothesis about myths, family myths and premises, if they're, um, you know, so, you know, I believe you're, you know, working with the um, myth that, you know, fathers knows best, and they may hypothesize around that. Or they may have a hypothesis that's analyzing communication patterns. And so these are the things they're going to focus on when they deliver that intervention as to what, what's going on, what's the role of the symptom um, in this family. So positive connotation. It's the Milan style reframe. So again, this is very similar. It is a, a form of systemic reframing, but the Milan team always used a positive. And so that's interpreting the behavior of each member of the family positively. And they're really focusing and emphasizing the benevolent motivation of each person. So reframing a child's problematic behavior as a way to keep the parents together um, is one way that they would reframe that. They would similarly reframe the parents' um, behavior as, you know, an expression of their love and caring for the child. Um, and so this is, the, the emphasis is that the therapist is always viewing the family members um, with less judgment and with greater hope. And so, you know, f f reframing, you know, a wife's nagging as, you know, her way of trying to connect with her husband and the husband's withdrawal, you know, as his way is, you know, he's trying to, you know, to, you know, establish, you know, his, you know, independence within the relationship or whatever it might be. And so you would find ways to, po whatever's going on, you're going to find a positive reframe for each person's role as much as possible. So as we talked about uh, earlier, circular questions are like the bread and butter in Milan therapy, and they are used to both assess and do intervention because it naturally in in a very gentle way and very organically reframes and puts everything in the broader systemic context for the individual couple or family. Counter paradox is very much um, like um, the uh, therapeutic double bind or what's called symptom prescription where you're telling the family not to change. And so you might tell a child, you know, in a particular family it might be, you know, maybe you need to um, keep being very depressed or um, because if you're not depressed, then your parents, you know, your mom might become depressed, or your parents might argue more, or their marriage might become it. So maybe it's just better if you stay a little bit depressed because it's better for the whole family. And, you know, we really appreciate the personal sacrifice you're making to do this. Um, and again, this is done thoughtfully, carefully. You don't do this with every symptom, every client. Um, but with certain problems and family dynamics, this is the type of intervention, again, that begins to make sense. And so uh, this is frequently used when families are like uncooperative with more direct interventions. And you will know, I promise you, you will have a moment if you work with couples and families or even individuals when paradox is the only logical solution and that's when you do it. So don't randomly try to just, you know, oh, maybe I'll go try paradox today. You will know when um, the system is so resistant to change that the prescribing the symptom and that automatically recontextualizes. So when you prescribe the symptom, the context changes. That You cannot do the symptom in the same way again. It no longer has the same meaning. So something is going to change. And so there are times where this is the most effective intervention um, and the only one that's going to help people get, help get people unstuck. So rituals are a type of behavioral prescription used in Milan. Um, and these are assignments that would address double binds. And these are used to help shift meaning. Um, and so 
things like uh, the rituals are used to create um, conflicting directives in a sequence. So um, a good example here is a woman who was caught um, between uh, her husband and a child. They asked her to, you know, act, you know, act as a wife on odd days of the week and as a mother on even days, and then be spontaneous on your seventh day. And again, this little experiment and directive highlights those family dynamics that no one, that people, that's not being acknowledged within the system. And there's no way you cannot not behave differently. And and it becomes much clearer what the dynamics are, kind of wakes people up out of their patterns and allows them to choose a different behavior. <clears throat> and however the family responds to this, it doesn't really matter from a long perspective. <clears throat> that information is taken in and they use that to refine their understanding of the family epistemology, the family, you know, interactional sequences, and they will refine their hypothesis and with that develop another intervention. And again, just like MRI, each week you take the feedback back from the system, you use that to refine your hypotheses, and then you deliver another intervention and see what happens. And so it's very much a very organic process until the symptoms are no longer necessary or part of the family homeostasis. The invariant prescription is a classic Milan intervention that is specifically designed to sever covert coalitions um, between a parent and a child. And so this is when you see that there's an alliance between a parent and a child, and they called it invariant because you could use this um, with virtually every family, and it seemed to work. And basically what the idea here is, is that you create a secret between the parents and you let the kids know that there is a secret. And this ends any inappropriate coalitions where one child feels, oh yeah, I'm mom's confidant. When, when that child learns that well, she and dad now have secrets that she's not part of, it severs that and allows the subsystems, that we're talking, um, or the, you know, the parents and the children, to have more healthy boundaries and alliances. And so this is a very quick way to um, sever this. So you can have the couple go on secret outings. The kids, you know, we just can't tell you, what, you know, why we need to be gone for the next, you know, two to four hours. It actually doesn't matter what they're doing. They could be shopping for furniture or going on a hot date. It doesn't matter. As long as the, the kids, as long as there is a secret between the two parents. And so uh, the emphasis is on creating secrets between the parents and a very clear division between the parents and the child. And that this often helps with, um, in situations where the children are having, um, <clears throat> where, yeah, where there's a coalition or children are acting out. Um, and um, there's an alliance between the two parents, or between a parent and a child. Tapestry weaving, applications of systemic approaches with diverse populations. So system systemic approaches, as you may have noticed, don't have theories of health or normalcy. So this makes it easier or more to apply across cultures because you're not trying to say, this is a family structure, healthy family structure, and all, everyone needs to look like this. So it can be much more adaptable because it works very much from within the client's worldview. It uses their language. I mean, it's not imposing a theory of health or an appropriate way to be a family. So systemic approaches have used, been used also with adolescents coming out to their families. It's important to know that um, gay and lesbian, bisexual, transgendered youth have much higher rates of suicidal ideation, substance abuse, self-harm, depression, anxiety. I mean, it's very important to consider these safety issues with them. Um, it's also interesting that most adolescents are actually able to accurately predict their parents' response um, to their coming out. And so it's um, important to discuss this, prepare for this. Um, and there's several models for how to work systemically um, with adolescents in the coming out process with their families. Systemic approaches actually have a, a growing um, research base on the, uh, the effectiveness. Uh, specifically, there are several evidence-based uh, systemic models that are particularly good for working with conduct disorder, uh, teen substance abuse. In fact, all of the uh, the evidence-based models that address conduct disorder, substance abuse, and teen substance abuse are based in systemic therapies. So it's exciting to see the research coming out and there's definitely a lot of systemic research even for adults in substance abuse with in terms of severe mental illness. Um, there are many systemic-based approaches that do have a, a strong evidence base and uh, some of the models are listed here.
So to sum up part one of this systemic uh, online lecture, um, the MRI approach and the Milan systemic approach, they are both distinct and yet share a lot of overlapping uh, characteristics. They both are focusing on how to perturb or interrupt the interactional uh, sequence. And so in the MRI, they're really focusing on the attempted solution, where in Milan, they're focusing more on the meanings that are being made, the family epistemological error, and their, their interventions are much more language-based, where in the MRI, they're more behavioral-based. And yet, the, the underlining fundamental conceptualizations are quite similar. And so in part two, we're going to discuss strategic uh, family therapy.